So let's pray and uh, let's begin our worship time together this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning just for this beautiful day that we have to come together and to worship. Uh, Lord, while the world seems chaotic at times and, and certainly there are, are as much anxiety lingering in our, in our society, we rest in the fact and in the truth that you are still absolutely sovereignly in control of this world. And what we may see as chaos and problems, Lord, it's within your plan and we are resting and trusting in that plan together today. We ask your blessing on our school year as we look forward to kicking off the, the next school year in just a couple short weeks. There's a lot to do, and I thank you so much for our school administration that have been giving tirelessly uh, toward getting our school reopened and the logistics of that and the challenges of that. And Lord, we just commit this year to you and just ask your blessing on our school and protection as well and strength and, and, uh, and, and diligence on our teacher side too. I'm sure there's a lot of unanswered questions on their minds as well. Lord, we ask now that as we turn our hearts toward worship that we would put aside all the, the cares and anxiety of the week and all the responsibilities that we will need to take care of later. Lord, help us to put those things away and just turn our attention fully upon you and worship you together as the body of Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Good morning. Good to see you this morning uh, on a beautiful Lord's Day today. Uh, we're going to begin by singing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The song is uh, talking about the fact that every good thing comes from God. It reminds me of uh, the passage in James that says, every good and perfect gift comes from God. I hope that as we sing our songs today that you will truly meditate on the truth of the words that we're singing and uh, I love to begin a, a service with this song because it asks God to tune our hearts to sing his praise. Let's stand as we sing. Come now, Father. Continue to worship our amazing God. Let's sing indescribable.
every lightning bolt. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun gives source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring we ask that you would use the circumstances and the events of our lives to draw us closer to yourself and make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would indeed tune our, tune our hearts now uh, to hear your word preached and speak to us, we ask, Holy Spirit, in this hour. Uh, 
In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, draw me ever near. Good morning once again. Just want to thank you for uh, joining us today, worshiping here at Grace Baptist Church. Hope your heart has already been encouraged and stirred this morning as we sing together uh, some great songs of worship today. You know, I was thinking this week, my, it's funny how your mind brings certain memories back in your mind that you haven't thought about for a long time. I, uh, I've said this before, but I purposefully <clears throat> am not a person that historically has been known as a person that would go out and run for the fun of it. I enjoy sports. I like athletics, but I like sports that require as little of long distance running as humanly possible. I hear <clears throat> that when I was in high school, I hear that our high school had a track team. I don't know. I think that's true. I had friends that ran on the track team. I never understood why you would do that. Shot put, I get that. I get jab, I get, but run? Well, when I got to college, I was no longer playing organized sports anymore. I, I moved away from that and got involved in something called academics, which I didn't know much about in high school either. Um, but I started trying to do well in school. But I got into my head that I was going to do a triathlon. And so the running part was pretty easy, actually. It surprisingly wasn't as horrible as I thought. The biking was <clears throat> pretty easy. That came easily to me. The swimming part, I won't even talk about that. That's what eliminated me from any consideration of ever doing a triathlon. I'm not afraid of the water. I'm not afraid to swim. I just, let me be blunt, I hate it. I hate everything about swimming pools. I know that makes me weird, but I don't like it. But I kept running. And the hospital where I was training at the time for my uh, former career, they were hosting a 5K. 
Now, I had never participated in my life in a organized race of any kind. And so I decided that I was going to do the hospital a favor and I was going to participate in this 5K, raise some money for the hospital. And you know what? I was just going to go win the thing. I was just going to go win. I had never, again, run an organized race in my life, but I just knew, I had pictures of like people, this is horrible, but I was in college. Okay, give me some, give me some, you know, give me some credit or some grace, I guess. In my mind, there'll be like people putting their, you know, getting out of their wheelchairs and putting their crutches down to run in this race. I had this image of like, I was going to be the most athletic person there. And I show up and there are guys who I'm pretty sure were on the national Olympic team. I mean, these guys were ripped. They were fast. They were like these incredible runners. And so I had a little gut check and thought, I am in big trouble. And so I decided that I was going to keep up with them no matter what. And I did all the way through the parking lot. And by the time we hit the trail, man, they were gone. Who knew you could run a mile in under like 10 minutes? Who knew? And then I start running. And I'm running and I'm sweating and I'm starting to hate it. But then I get to this little marker on the side of the road and it says, you just finished mile one. 5K, in case you're not aware, is a little over three miles. One third of the way there. At that point, I was pretty much ready to quit. I wanted to just go back, lick my wounds, and pretend it never happened. But I finished the race, in case you're curious, in less than stellar time, but I did finish. And I often think about the Christian life is so often imaged as a race, isn't it? It's not a sprint. It's not something that you just run this very quick, brief period of time, which I'm fine with that kind of running, but I don't like distance running. And that's what the Christian life is really all about. And you think about the race, man, at the beginning, there's this, you're, 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 you're revved up, you're ready to run, and there's a crowd of people, and you're kind of feeding off one another's energy, and there's this excitement, and the gun fires, and you start to run. And then you get to mile marker one and you feel like you're going to die. And you just want to quit. And then if you fumble through and you keep persevering, you come to the end of the race and there's people, cheer, come on, you can do it, finish. And the finish line is there and you're rejuvenated and you make it through the race. But in the middle, it's terrible, isn't it? And that's kind of how the Christian life is pictured. Man, do you remember when you first came to Christ and the excitement that you had? Man, you were going to win every family member to Christ and your neighbors were going to have this revival and they were going to come to Christ. And then there was going to be this great, God was going to use you to do miraculous things. And you found out a very hard truth. It doesn't work that way. And that sin that you thought was going to be eradicated from your life, man, it just kept coming back. The middle was messy. The middle was hard. The beginning is exciting and the end is exciting because you'll see Christ. But in the beginning, while the beginning is hard, the middle is tough. You know, I read a statistic yesterday that changing illustrations a little bit here just to think about another kind of sort of race imagery one report said that one third one third of college students drop out more than half of college students take more than six years to graduate why college is hard it's difficult it's a lot of work another statistic found that 50% of people, students, that begin graduate programs never finish. So again, starting is easy, but finishing is difficult. We've been looking in Philippians 2 at Paul's illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we spent a couple of weeks looking at this imagery that we find in Philippians 2, beginning of verse 5, and I'm going to read up to our text this morning, kind of set the flow of where we've been. 
And Paul is writing to this church that is so dear to him, important to him, and he has this intimate relationship with them, and they are doing a lot right. They are running the race. They are being faithful. They are staying committed to Christ. But notice what Paul does, and he says in verse 5, again, just to pick up the flow of where we've been, Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery or thought it uh, that the form of God, rather, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, quoted the King James there in the middle for you, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Now, if you stop there for a minute, you might ask this question. So what? Okay. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? What do we do with this information? What do we do with this illustration? What do we do with this mind of Christ? And by the way, Paul's still building off the idea of walking worthy of the gospel. And now we come to a little more of a practical section, and Paul begins to answer this question, so what? What do we do with this imagery? Well, look at verses 12 and 13, which will be our text this morning. Paul says, therefore... Because of this, because of the mind of Christ and the illustration of Christ, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure." What do we do with the mind of Christ? What do we do with this commandment to walk worthy of the gospel? Well, Scripture is clear, not just in Philippians 2, but in other places, that God expects, this is earth shattering, you ready? God expects his children to obey him. God expects that those who claim the name of Christ to actively serve him. Now, have you known people in your life that have walked away from church and walked away from ministry entirely? I do. You probably do as well. I met a guy, I was telling my wife actually recently, the guy's name was Jim, by the way. His name just came to me. I couldn't remember his name until right this moment. Jim. Jim was a guy I worked night shift with for years. And we would get into these really in-depth conversations about Christ and the Bible. And, and he told me once, he said, yeah, I used to believe all that stuff. He said, I said that I believed, became a deacon in his church, by the way. He said, I said I believed all that stuff for one reason, to make my wife like me. He said, actually, she was my girlfriend at the time. And once we got married, he goes, I stopped going to church. I, go, I don't believe that junk. He said, when you're dead, you're dead. No shock, he walked away from the church. He wasn't a true believer. But what about those who are just outright disobedient believers? They don't want to be a part of the body of Christ. They don't want to serve Christ. They don't want to live out their salvation in a very practical way. And so now Paul gives us this this, this instruction when he gives us this commandment, which we'll pull apart in a minute, work out your salvation. Do something with it. Are you living a life that is worthy of the gospel? Are you living out the faith that you claim to believe? Now, these two verses are very interesting for another reason. Because if you're reading them carefully, it probably brings to your mind this interesting dichotomy. Okay? And if the kids are paying attention to their handout, it's not just a dichotomy. It's a paradox. Okay, that word should be on your sheet. It is a paradox because verse 12 and verse 13, at some level, they seem to contradict each other a little bit. 
This idea of whose responsibility is salvation? Is salvation a work of man? Is salvation simply the so under the sovereignty of God? Which is it? And so this morning, I want to put up a little picture here to illustrate these two verses. And as we think about this picture that we're going to show you here in just a second, we think about this, that really 12 and 13 are a beautiful picture of this. Now, let me take a quick poll. How many of you see an older lady in that picture, out of curiosity? Okay, a few of you. Some of you have probably seen this before. How many of you see a young lady? Wow, like the vast majority. How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Some of you didn't raise your hand, so I'm just curious. The, rea the, rea the, real the reality is, in this picture, there is both. There is an older lady, and there is also a younger lady. And statistics say, if I'm not mistaken, that more people see actually the older lady, if, if I'm not incorrect, than the younger lady. So you guys just totally destroyed that, if my memory serves me right. But this picture, to me, is this illustration of this discussion about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. You can take the picture down and you can look up that later. If you couldn't see the other one, you can play with it later. In verse 13, we are introduced to this imagery of man's responsibility. Work out your salvation. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we find these words, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's this responsibility to believe. Books like the book of Proverbs and countless other commandments in Scripture are given to us as calls of obedient living to the gospel. Now, if we take verse 13, which again, we'll pull these verses apart in a minute, we see God's sovereignty. In fact, we find these words in John 6, no man can serve, can come unto me rather, unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Books like Daniel highlight the sovereignty of God. And so which is it? Well, when we try to reconcile these two biblical truths based on human reasoning, we are bound to fall inevitably into the ditches of dangerous extremes. The reality is that we often indiscriminately and recklessly vilify people by slapping these particular labels on folks. Oh, he's just a Calvinist. Oh, he's just an Arminian. And half the time, we don't even know what those terms mean, but they sound really good. And so we just label people. Oh, I just dismiss him because he's a Calvinist. I dismiss that person. They're too Arminian or whatever. And the reality is that there have been, by the way, heroes of the faith that would fall under both categories. And so when we think about these verses, and I always, by the way, I always answer this. People say, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? I always say this. Look, I'll tell you what I believe and then call me whatever you want. I've been called a Calvinist. I've been called an Arminian. I've been called Pelagian. Okay, call me what you want. That's fine. But what I would say is there is a sovereign God ruling and reigning over this universe. And we are responsible to obey him. How that meshes out, I would challenge you to solve that riddle the same as you can solve the Trinity riddle. They're both presented in Scripture side by side. The biblical writers accepted this tension, and so should we. God is sovereign in the affairs of men, but it does not negate the fact that we as followers of Christ are commanded to live out our salvation in a way that brings glory to God. And so let's pull apart this text this morning and see this tension of what this looks like and how we live the Christian life in this divine tension. And so from these couple of verses, we're going to see two essential realities of our salvation. Number one, you are commanded to work out your salvation. Paul says, wherefore... 
in response to everything that I have been describing to you about walking worthy of the gospel and everything that I am talking to you about, about having the mind of Christ, this now is how we are to live out this commandment to have the mind of Christ, to walk worthy of the gospel. And Paul now is commanding the believers at Philippi to live their Christian life obediently. By the way, this commandment does not apply to unbelievers. People who reject Christ can maybe do some good things because of God's general revelation. They can do some good things, but they can't accomplish what Paul is calling us to because they don't have the spirit of God residing in them. Having the mind of Christ will produce humility that looks like Christ. It will produce a submissiveness to God's word. It will produce also this practical outworking of our salvation. Now, Paul tells them, and he's said this to them before, he's saying, look, I'm in jail, I'm in prison, I can't be with you physically, but even in my absence, I am calling you to faithfulness. Because at the end of the day, they were not obeying Paul, they were not doing the right thing because of the presence of the apostle, they were called to do the right thing because of God's commandments to them. And so they had been characterized already by obedience. They had been characterized by people who were serving Christ. They were a faithful group of, of people. But God expects them to be obedient even in the absence of leadership, even in the absence of an apostle, even in the absence of other church leaders. Their obedience was not to be based on Paul's geographic location, but on the realities of God's abiding presence. So now here's the commandment. Work out your salvation. Now, let's be clear. This is not, is not a call to a works-based salvation. It's not what he's saying. He's not saying work for your salvation and achieve it. In fact, if you know church history even a little bit, you know that there have been books of the Bible that initially, as, they, as the writers were writing under the inspiration of God, there was this debate among early, early, very early church fathers and leaders to discern, okay, not, not elect which books of the Bible were inspired or to decide by somebody, but to discern which books of the Bible were inspired, which ones fit within the scriptures. And one of the very heated discussions centered around the Apostle Paul's writing in which he is very clear that salvation is by faith alone versus the book of James that says that faith without works is dead. And there was this internal discussion about whether or not salvation was by faith alone or was it faith and works? What was the, what was the resolution to this problem? It's very simple in a sense. Faith has always been by faith alone. That's what the Reformation was about. It's only by faith. It's not by works of righteousness. It's not by what I do. It's not by, about the money I give. It's not about certain activities. It's only through faith, sola fide, by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone. But what do we do with James? What do we do with passages like Philippians 2.12 that says that you are to work out your salvation? This is not dealing with how people get saved. It's not even dealing with how people stay saved. That's how I grew up. I grew up being taught that you could come to Christ by faith in Christ and then you had to work to keep your salvation. And if you didn't do certain good works, you would lose your salvation, which is the ditch of human responsibility or human ability to take away their salvation. Human works. By the way, I didn't say this before, but the, the ditch on the human responsibility side is that there are some that teach and preach that God doesn't know what you're going to do until you do it. Okay, that's the ditch of focusing on humanity. Humanity determines the mind of God. Heavens, no. God is perfectly sovereign. 
The other ditch on the sovereignty side is fatalism, where I have no call to obedience. And so how do we manage this, this tension? He's not dealing with how people get saved or how they stay saved. He's dealing with how saved people live. Faith without works, James says, is dead. Dead faith does nothing. A lack of genuine faith doesn't produce works of righteousness. However, genuine salv salvific faith, faith that changes a heart, changes a person internally means that person will work out their salvation. This is a commandment. And the form of this word means it is an ongoing, continuous effort. The idea is to work your salvation toward completion. Workout comes from a word that means to achieve, that there will be results. There will be some visual aspect to my work. This was often used, by the way, in ancient Greek. This word was used to talk about digging for silver in silver mines. Work the ground, dig, keep digging, keep working, keep laboring for the gospel. Like working in a field, our biggest harvest will only come when we are laboring for Christ. I, I don't quote, I don't use many lengthy quotes in our, in our public times of preaching, but I, today I want to read you one. It comes from a gentleman by the name of Gordon Fee, who is a New Testament scholar. And he says this regarding Philippians 2, verse 12. He says, A great deal of unnecessary ink has been spilt over this passage as to whether salvation has to do with the individual believer or with the corporate life of the community. But this is a false dichotomy, Fee writes. The context makes it clear that this is not a soteriological text per se or a text talking about how you get saved. Fee continues, it's not dealing with people getting saved or saved people persevering. Rather, it is an ethical text dealing with how saved people live out their salvation in the context of a believing community and in the world, which we'll get to next week. What Paul is referring to, therefore, is the present outworking of their salvation within the believing community of Philippi. What, Paul, what, what Fee is saying, what Paul is saying is don't leave your faith in the pew. You know, we, we use this phrase in our terminology all the time. We're going to go to church. And I, I get it. I understand what we're saying. But the church, if it is the body and the body of Christ then goes out and works out their salvation in the community, we take what we know, we take what we learn, and we apply it to the community in which we live and serve, putting your salvation to work, to applying it to life's circumstances. Now, that's pretty straightforward, I think, I hope. But Paul now gives us a couple qualifiers. How do we do that? Okay, what, what, what should our attitude be when we are working out our salvation? My works don't save me, but my works will give indication of my salvation. And as Jesus said, if I'm truly saved, there will be fruit. There will be a visual representation of my salvation. Notice Paul says that as I'm working out my salvation, I do this with fear and trembling. I think those two words, fear and trembling, are of exceptional importance. Because if I am truly going to follow Paul's logic and have the mind of Christ, which includes Humility, which includes submissiveness to the word of God, which includes servanthood. I have to do this with fear and trembling. Because the minute that I lose this respect for God and lose this respect for my position under God, then I am very likely to take matters into my own hands and simply do ministry for my own glory or for my own good in my own strength. But Paul says, don't ever lose this reverential respect for who God is. 
Don't ever neglect or overlook his sovereignty, his power, his goodness, his holiness. And so as I'm working out my salvation, the idea of fear, this word comes from the Greek word phobos, which is where we get our word phobia from. It literally means terror. And I not only live in this reverential fear, I live with trembling, quaking in fear. The word, this is where we get our word tremor from. This is holding someone in high respect, high level of reverence. So as I am working out my salvation, I am doing so in a reverential awe of who God is. I'm recognizing his power and strength and remembering each and every day that my behavioral sins are an outworking of my own sinful heart. Jeremiah 17, we've been studying on Wednesday nights. But the minute I lose my reverence for God, the minute I lose perspective on who God is, I am very quickly going to become consumed with self and lose the realities of God's love and grace and fall into the trap of arrogance. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. It's one of my favorite Old Testament books for a lot of reasons, but I love the end of the book. When Solomon writes this, he says, The end of the matter, after all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This is what you're called to do. Fear God and keep his commandments. One concern that I have in our day and age is that we have taken God and we have reduced him down to someone who's just a little better than us. We've humanized them. Oh, don't, we don't want to dismiss the love of God. We don't want to dismiss the grace of God. We don't want to dismiss the uh, uh, long suffering of God. We never want to neglect those rich and sweet truths of Scripture. Our culture is not at risk of that, but we are at risk of overlooking God's holiness and God's power, and God's sovereignty, and God's judgment. I, I am always reminded, even throughout Scripture, you take angelic beings, for instance. Angels are not God. They are not a God. They were created by God, just the same as you and I. You and me, I think. They were created beings. And yet every time we see an angel make an appearance in Scripture, the person in the presence of the angel falls on their face in absolute fear and reverence before an angel. It's not this beautiful woman in long flowing clothing and they pray, oh, you're so beautiful. It is on your face. Imagine how much greater God is than that. How much more awesome he is how much more a deserving of our reverence is God and we have just tamed God down to our own terminology and our own ideology and Paul says may it never be work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you are in the presence of a holy righteous almighty God I mean let's be let's be frank this morning do you actually believe that or is that just too out there for you? Well, I just think God is love. He is. But don't tame him. He's not tame. He's God. So working out our salvation is this lifelong endeavor. Sanctification is this process through which we are working through salvation. Think about this for a moment, the aspect. We use this term salvation pretty regularly, and sometimes I think we lose the aspects of salvation. Our salvation has justified us and delivered us from the penalty of our sin once and for all. We've been delivered, not like the Arminian theology I grew up under, that you could lose your salvation or do something horrible to lose your salvation. That's my second answer, by the way. Are you a Calvinist or Arminian? I'm not Arminian. I know that. 
because I don't believe you can lose your salvation. It is one time secured for all of eternity. That is a part of our salvation. Our future salvation is our glorification. Now let's think about the race imagery we started with. The beginning of the race is great. I'm justified, declared righteous because of the righteousness of Christ. And one day I will be glorified. I will be rescued from sin for all eternity, from the very presence of sin. But that's future. I'm not glorified yet, neither are you. Which, by the way, my church growing up also taught sinless perfection. And then when you reach sinless perfection, then and only then you could be sure of your salvation. The problem was that people defined sin on their terms, not God's. And so where we are right now in the process of our salvation being realized is in this messy middle called sanctification. This process in which we are growing more like Christ. We are called to become more and more like Jesus. And it's a mess. And it's hard and it's difficult and it's frustrating and you feel like quitting at times. That's why I love the book of Proverbs in verse 20, or verse 6 rather, of chapter 20. It says, a faithful man who can find. Who, who can find a faithful man? Why are they so few and far between? Well, genuine faith, faithfulness takes a long time to mature. Genuine faithfulness requires a lot of hard work, diligence. I, I, I alluded to my dismissive attitude toward academics in high school. I learned something in college. Did you know that if you studied and worked hard, went to class and listened, you'd get good grades? Who knew? Who knew? And maybe you're frustrated in your Christian life because you're just sitting under the proverbial palm tree saying, God, make me like Jesus. And God is saying, you better start working out your salvation. Oh, your work doesn't save you, but it matures you through the process of investing in ministry, investing in people, reading scripture, exposing myself to the truths of, word, of, of God's word. That requires diligence and hard work. John says in 1 John chapter 2, he says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, if we're working out our salvation. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. I know Christ, but I'm doing nothing with it. You're a liar. That's what God says. And the truth is not in him, but whoever keeps the word of God in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we know that we are in him. I love that. We know it. We know we are in him. Confidence. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, in the last few minutes, we spent a ton of time on one verse because it's so important. But in the last few minutes, think about the second side to this coin. Because you're not in it alone. This isn't a call to simply boost yourself up and produce spiritual sanctification in yourself because you can't do that. Notice what he says, because or for, verse 13, it is God who works in you. It's not in your own strength. It's not in your own power. Yes, you have responsibility, but there is a sovereign, holy, righteous, all-powerful God working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I love that. Remember what Paul said in chapter 1, verse 6. He said, and I am sure of this. He who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion, glorification. There will be an end result when your salvation is ultimately realized. God's not going to give up on you. God is working in you. He's empowering you. He is strengthening you. God's sovereignty should never lead to this 
fatalistic approach to life, but rather to serve as an incentive to serve and to submit ourselves to God as he wills. God is, in a sense, working in us so that we can work outwardly. As believers, we have access to this empowering work of God that is strengthening us for service. I alluded to this last week, and every time I go home, you dissect every word you said, and you say, I probably didn't make that clear, so I get to try it again today. I I said, I think last week, maybe two weeks ago, that there there are weeks when I, I look at the plate of ministry that's set before me and say, there is no way I'm going to accomplish that. There's no way. And one of two things happen. One, something gets taken off my plate that I didn't anticipate being taken away. Or I have this infusion of God's power. That may sound creepy to you, weird to you. I'm just telling you it happens. When God says, hey, I have called you to this, I'm going to empower you to do it. You see, God doesn't call the strong and mighty to serve. He calls the humble and willing to serve, and then he empowers them. It is God who is working in you. For what purpose? To do his good pleasure. You you get the privilege of ministering to God's people for the glory of God. If American church is struggling with another aspect of Christianity, it might be that one. Because Christianity has been reduced to just going to a service that entertains me. They have the music I like. They have the whatever that I prefer. And I go and I listen. And then maybe the sermon's really short and lots of funny illustrations, some stories. And then I go home feeling good and I have done my duty. That is not the Christian life as I see it. It is God working in you and through you to work for him, to serve for him. Not be served, to serve, to work out your salvation. So in closing, remember this. You cannot work out your own salvation in your own strength. While we are called to invest energy and time and labor into our salvation, it is God who produces the ultimate outcome in our spiritual lives. But for us, are we putting our salvation into action? Are we servants like Christ? Are we humble like Christ? Are we using our gifts and abilities for Christ's glory? Now, the biblical record doesn't give us a specific model or mold of what this looks like, but it is God calling each of his people to serve him within their giftedness and within their ability. I love Ezekiel 36. In verses 25 through 27, the prophet says this. He says, I will sprinkle, this is God speaking through the prophet. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Notice there's no hint of you cleaning yourself in those verses, in those words. And I will give you a new heart. In other words, I can't just manufacture it myself. I need God's working. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Your call to obedience You're called to walk worthy of the gospel, but you do so through the power of God in you. So what is Paul saying? Believer, Christian, work out your own salvation while resting in God's sovereign strength to empower you for your journey of service. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this very challenging text before us this morning. It is one that as we think through it, it's 
It's challenging for many reasons. One, Lord, help us under your divine strength to become faithful in our labor for you, working out our salvation. But also in that labor, not becoming self-reliant, not becoming self-sufficient, but rather resting and trusting on you to, to provide for us your divine empowerment. God, we thank you that as believers, we can experience your working in us to will and to work for your own good pleasure, not ours. And so, Lord, I pray that as each one of us quiet our hearts before you this morning, that we would surrender our own agendas, our own ideas, our own plans to you and walk in your strength and in your power in absolute humble service for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.